There's the sound, yeah, we're good. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Um, just some uh, very quick paperwork or you know, no, notice before we get started. Um, when you are exiting the talk, there is a little voting box on you know, red, green, um, please vote green. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Um, so, welcome to my talk, uh, Reflections on Trust in the Software Supply Chain. Wow, that, that changes, that weird. Okay, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> audio. Um, <laughs> I'm Jeremy Long, uh, 20 plus years in information security, I'm the founder of the OWASP Dependency Check Project, I'm currently a principal security engineer at ServiceNow. Uh, the contents of this talk are from my own personal research and do not represent any of my work uh, at my day job. Uh, of course, opinions are my own and not those of service now. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about software supply chain security. Uh, we're gonna go over what we're doing today, a gap I see in our current efforts. I will then go into a demo uh, outlining the type of supply chain attack that keeps me up at night. You're gonna wanna stick around for the demo. I've gotten a lot of really great feedback on that. And I'll close with proposing a solution to the trusting trust problem. As we all know, the software supply chain is absolutely massive. The Census 2 study from the Linux Foundation found that all modern software is made up of 70 to 90 percent open source code. As would be no surprise, CI/CD infrastructure is also modern software made up of open source code. In some cases, it's entirely open source. Maven, Gradle, Jenkins, Spinnaker, Drone, Poetry, the list goes on and on. These are the tools that we use to build and deploy code. When we're looking at this, we also have to think about the third-party services that are also used as part of our CI-CD environment. I'm very focused on the CI-CD environment. We also have third-party services that are used during runtime, but I'm focused on more the things that are being used during the build time. These are also modern software made up of 70 to 90% open source code. When you think about it, the software supply chain is almost incomprehensibly large. And with anything this large, you know, attackers are gonna target the supply chain. Supply chain attacks are nothing new. From traditional supply chain attacks targeting known vulnerabilities to more complicated supply chain attacks, some of which may require nation state level sponsorship to accomplish, Gartner predicts that by 2025, 45% of organizations worldwide will experience a supply chain attack. These attacks are not going to stop. They're going to evolve. They're going to get more complicated, harder to detect. From an attacker's perspective, it just makes sense. If I can attack and compromise something once and have it affect hundreds or thousands of targets, the payoff can be huge. Additionally, while we have been making advances, a lot of supply chain attacks still bypass the traditional security controls enterprises and organizations have put in place. Another thing that kind of scares me a little bit is we've been seeing more and more attacks on the development tool chain. This scares me because I've read Ken Thompson's paper, Reflections on Trust and Trust. If you haven't read Ken's paper, I highly recommend it. It is a delightful three-page read. Uh, Thompson discusses compromising the compiler in such a way that the back door is never in the published source code. Yet, if that subverted compiler compiles the source code for the compiler to create the next version of the compiler, it will propagate that back door forward into the new compiler. Worse, if you use that subverted compiler to compile the operating system, it will inject a backdoor into the authentication mechanism of the operating system, allowing any attacker with, the, with that known password to log into the operating system. From a supply chain perspective, this is absolutely terrifying. How can we trust our builds to produce secure code? Well, to quote the paper, the moral is obvious. You can't trust software or you can't trust code that you did not totally create yourself. The solar winds breach was very close to a trusting trust problem. There was an assumption that the build server was secure, and yet malware on that build server injected 
a backdoor into the Orion product, which was then delivered to clients of SolarWinds through an automatic, uh, automated update system. This affected Microsoft, several security firms, the US government, and the count is about 18,000 clients of SolarWinds were affected by this. And that was a huge attack, and most people know about that. Solar winds and other events brought about the need for the executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity. When published two, two and a half years ago, uh, the executive order outlined many practices required to secure our software supply chain. Work on some of these works already well underway prior to this executive order being published. But since then, over the last two, two and a half years, we've seen frenzied activity um, people producing refined guidelines on how to do the implementation around some of these requirements. We've seen companies starting up. Um, it's just, we've seen a ton of activity trying to help people comply with some of these high-level requirements. I'm going to focus on these three requirements from Section 4 on enhancing uh, the software supply chain security. Provenance, software bill of materials, and automated security testing for known and potential vulnerabilities, um, possibly also the software composition analysis. Um, I'm gonna focus on these because they focus on dependencies. All the requirements in there are great, but I'm really gonna focus on these for this talk. Um, note that I may use the term artifact, library, component, or dependency almost interchangeably throughout this talk because in context, they kind of mean the same thing. So what is a dependency? Well, a software component that is used directly or indirectly by a program. Most of us are familiar with runtime dependencies. This is the runtime dependency graph of a application that I am heavily involved with. From a security perspective, most of us are really familiar with these runtime dependencies because software composition analysis tools are um, reporting vulnerabilities in these because members of this community continue to find more and more vulnerabilities in the components that we use, and we end up having to patch these. If you're a developer, you know, you're almost getting overloaded with patching requests from our SCA tools. But as I alluded to earlier, there's actually a lot more in our build than just these runtime dependencies that get shipped that we may have to care about. In many applications, we have test cases and test scope dependencies. On this project, that expands our dependency graph quite a bit once we start including the test scope dependencies. Well, we also have, in a lot of our build management systems like Maven, Gradle, Poetry, we have plugins. And those plugins are also part of, or could be something that we would need to consider as a build time dependency that we may need to care about. And if we expand to that, I am ashamed to say this is the real <laughs> complete dependency graph of the OWASP dependency check project. This includes all of the runtime, compile time, test dependencies, build plugins, all of the transitive dependencies, absolutely everything. This is a massive amount of dependencies. Why would we care about these? This isn't shipped. This isn't part of the application that our users have on their system. Well, what I'm going to show you when we get to the demo in a little bit is that anything running as part of the build has the ability to affect the build output. Think about that. Anything running during the build has the ability to affect the build output. Well, when we look at uh, software supply chain and, and you know specifically looking at artifacts and dependencies, we'll end up seeing two leading frameworks. Um, the supply chain levels for <laughs> supply chain levels for software artifacts or SALSA and the OWASP software component verification standard. Um, both of these have a ton of great requirements that if you can meet, um, meet these requirements, they're really gonna raise your assurance of your supply chain. One of the things that they have in common is that they both talk about provenance. These are the definitions from both SALSA and the Software Component Verification Standard. I actually like the definition from the Software Component Verification Standard a little bit better because if you read their full glossary, they go into things like not only 
provenance, but they talk about pedigree and the language used in their glossary more matches traditional manufacturing and supply chain. Um, you know, it, it better matches other industries. It's not just software. But overall, if you read these, provenance is basically a record of what went into the build and what came out of the build, or you know, it's a recording of that process. So if we're gonna create provenance, we're gonna take a look at the source code, we're gonna see where it came from, we're gonna get the exact commit hash, we're gonna create a record of that, and we're gonna digitally sign it. We're gonna look at the dependencies being brought into the build, we're gonna create a record of that, and we're gonna digitally sign that. We're gonna look at the build commands that are run, the build tools, we're gonna create a record of that, and we're gonna digitally sign that record. And then we're gonna look at the build artifact. We're gonna create a record of that and we're gonna digitally sign that. One key thing to understand, this has nothing to do with how secure the build output is. This is only a recording of where the build inputs came from and what was the build output. The signature does not imply it is secure. Knowing the exact version of the source code and the dependencies that went in and being able to validate that you are using the official release of that build artifact, that is extremely useful if you're actually doing that level of validation. Uh, it's going to raise your assurance level quite a bit. Um, additionally, provenance information will provide a ton of great information for a forensics investigation after a breach. I can't stress this enough, that working on this provenance, even though it, I'm not saying that it's proving that it's secure, it, it does help, it does increase your assurance, but it is not something that you can just trust and go, oh, it's signed, so that must be secure. <laughs> so it, at its core, it's just, this is what the build inputs were, this is what the build outputs were. So let's take a step back and look at Salsa version 1.0, the threats that were discussed um, when they came up with version 1.0 of Salsa. Or more specifically, what were the threats that were deemed out of scope? Use a compromised runtime dependency. I actually understand why this is deemed out of scope. Um, there's some technical reasons we'll actually touch on briefly in a little bit. Um, but what else is it was considered out of scope? Use a compromised build time dependency. Again, I kind of understand why this was deemed out of scope. This has one, it's really hard. This almost gets into the trusting trust problem. And it also has a little bit of an impact um, that we'll talk about later that's the same as the runtime dependencies. Um, the fact that Salsa is not transitive, but we'll, we'll get into that. Um, so today, what is being done about these two threats? Well, a primary control is, of course, software composition analysis. Um, these tools will tell you if you're using a known vulnerable runtime dependency. Uh, something that's deployed with your application. But as I've been talking about, what about the things that are part of your build? Well, what you have today are SCA tools that work at the repository level. They're gonna flag everything in your private repository that is vulnerable. You lose some specificity about whether it is known vulnerable, uh, like if it's a test dependency, a compile time dependency, a build plugin, you kind of lose that specificity. But most people who are using tools at this level, it's actually part of a layered defense. So they are doing testing to look at what their runtime vulnerabilities are as well. Uh, what else do we have? Well, with the release of OWASP Dependency Check 8.0, we actually did include the ability that you can scan your Maven and Gradle plugins for known, vulnerable, known vulnerabilities. Uh, I'm not aware of any other SCA tool out there that can do this. I'm not saying they don't exist. <laughs> I just don't know of them. Uh, you do have to use the uh, dependency check Maven or Gradle plugin to do this. You can't do it with the CLI, the Docker image, anything else. You have to use the build plugins to get that capability. We also have, of course, SBOMs, Software Bill of Materials. This is another thing where um, in a lot of cases, uh, we can look at our runtime dependencies. Uh, the two most common formats are, of course, Cyclone DX and uh, SPDX. Cyclone DX is an OWASP flagship project, and SPDX is from the Linux Foundation. As I said, 
most commonly, we can look at our runtime dependencies. Um, companies will ask vendors for their SBOMs to see what um, vulnerabilities may exist, what are the risks of using this vended software from both known vulnerabilities, legal compliance, uh, and, and, and so we've got a way through these SBOMs, if we're able to get them from our vendors, of understanding what are the risks of using that software. It's great. But going into that theme that I have here, what about how that vended product was made? Luckily, Steve Springett is a very smart individual. Uh, he's actually here um, at the conference. Uh, he was running for the board. Um, I hope he gets it. Uh, but he's a very smart individual, and when I asked him a year and a half ago if anything was being done to record or monitor the build time dependencies that were, that, that were used to create the software, he actually pointed me at an issue in the Cyclone DX specification that was created May 17th, 2020, prior to the executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity. And I'm happy to say, that with the release of Cyclone DX 1.5 earlier this year, we now have the Manufacturing Bill of Material specification support. It's fantastic. It may take a little time for some of the tooling, specifically the tooling to create the M-bombs, but we're on our way. We have a way to track how the software was built. But as we all know, SCA and SBOM they're really good at finding known vulnerable dependencies. Worrying about and monitoring for known vulnerable dependencies is important. It's probably one of the most important things you can do in your security tooling. But what supply chain attack has kept me up at night since reading about solar winds? I guarantee it hasn't been known vulnerable dependencies. Mark Kerfee over at Crash Override has had some really spectacular tweets about supply chain security. Some of them aged a little bit better than others, such as tweeting about an RCE in a logging framework prior to log for shell <laughs> But this one, this one has always stuck out with me for a little bit uh, since I read it. What if a library in an IDE backdoored everything built with it? To me, that's a little short-sighted. Worse would be a compromised build plugin that backdoored everything built with it. IDEs aren't used in our CI CD environments. CI CD environments are how we build and ship code. Right now, if a malicious build plugin or a compile time dependency were discovered, say something like Swagger Code Gen or JUnit were compromised, they weren't. But as a thought exercise, what if they were? <laughs> What if they could cause a solar winds style breach or attack that compromised the build output? If you think about that and you think about your build environments, if this happened, how would you know which builds were affected? How would you know where that was deployed? If you think hunting for log for J was bad, something like this, I don't even want to think about it. So let's talk about how we build one in Java. Um, <laughs> this is the malicious dependencies repository that I opened up um, when I gave a version of this talk at Black Hat earlier this year. Um, I've been asked to make sure that people, um, <laughs> or not to make sure that people know, but uh, to, to let people know that this is the first publicized version of this type of attack that I'm aware of. Uh, those in the SCA community have talked about this. Uh, even um, Jeff Williams did a talk, yeah, I think in 2008, on Enterprise Rootkits, I think was what the name of the talk, and he discussed this in that paper, but he didn't actually show a working example of it. This is a working example. So, uh, let's actually just jump into the demo here. Um, so, this is the malicious dependencies repo. Um, uh, yeah, that is going to work. The uh, the uh, analyzer repo right here, or folder, that is something that would be owned by the attacker. And the demo repo here, that is something that your developers or yourself, if you are a developer, may have created. 
So let's see what this actually does at runtime. Um, well, of course, this white terminal here is the attacker terminal, because we all know attackers don't like dark themes. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to start spin up Netcat here. And we're going to go over to the developer you know, terminal. And I'm just going to do on that demo application, Maven clean install. Just takes a second. We see it compile and build, run the test cases. Everything's great. I'm just going to run the application here. And we're going to see that the Spring Banner comes, Spring Boot Banner comes up, and it's Tomcat's running. And let's just test to make sure this thing is working. I'm just going to run curl localhost, and greetings from Spring Boot. You know, it's this is just a vanilla Spring Boot initializer application, um, just as kind of a demo. But what happened over on that terminal, uh, on the attacker's terminal here? I have a reverse shell on that developer's machine. This could have been a production server. Build, uh, it could have been a testing server, production server, out on EC2, who knows. And we have a reverse shell that just connected back to um, my system. Um, where would this have come from? I'm just going to kill this. And you'll notice that the uh, reverse shell ended because they really were connected uh, right there. So where could this backdoor have really come from? Well, this is the demo application, and it really is just a very vanilla, there is no hardly any code in this, in this application at all. It's pretty much just a Spring Boot initializer app. The only difference is I read about this really useful Spring Build Analyzer that works at compile time to identify some uh, misconfigurations in my Spring Boot application. I thought it would be really useful. Um, some, some friends of mine talked about it. So I included that. And so that must be where that backdoor came from. Well, let's uh, jump over and take a look at this. This is a, the analyzer is a multi-module Maven project. I did make this a little bit more complicated uh, just to show a few ways that you can inject code. Um, and basically this is just a Maven build plugin could have been a compile, uh, it could have just been a jar. It works either way. Um, it has an annotation processor. And if you look at this, it doesn't actually really do anything other than loop over the annotations. So there is no backdoor in the Spring Build Analyzer. Where the malicious code come from? Well, let's go look uh, at the build helper. This is actually a Maven extension. Again, I'm not expecting everybody to know that, but that's what this is. This is a Maven extension. But if you look at the implementation, there's nothing there. Where did the back door come from? I have no idea. Well, let's, let's take a look at the test cases. And sure enough, while I would expect to see the build helper test as a unit test for the build helper, the compile ensure spring application or spring annotation and sensor drop, those are actually the back door uh, where, where the malicious code is. Um, I put it in the test directory because even if you were scanning um, this project for malicious code, chances are you're going to skip the test directory. And this sensor drop is where that malicious code actually exists. And even better, if you were looking for things like uh, process builder right here or sockets, this is the this is actually the reverse shell and the fun part about this is it's a static string even if you ran static analysis against this looking for a process builder it's in a string it's not actually a code construct so it's not you are probably not going to find it unless you're using a very simplistic grep which is going to have a ton of false positives so how does this actually make it in how does this get into my Spring Boot application? Because the build helper is a compile time dependency. It doesn't, it's not a runtime dependency. The test case actually copies everything in from the uh, test case, uh, test classes in the Spring Boot help, or in the uh, build helper to the target classes of the Spring Build application. It's a little easier to see this um, in, a, in more of a visual demonstration, so I'll jump back over to this and, uh, <laughs> and, and go to the next slide. So again, everything in the uh, 
light pink reddish is something that would be owned by the attacker. The build helper Maven starts up, compiles the source code, compiles the test code, and those malicious, the malicious code in the test directory um, gets compiled, and then the unit test actually copies that malicious code from the test classes into the target classes of the Spring Build Analyzer. Maven then compiles the source code for the Spring Build Analyzer and puts it right alongside all that malicious code. It then bundles everything up into a jar, and, and you can then publish it to something like Maven Central. Your developers come along, find out about this really amazing, useful tool, include it in their build, compromises the build, injects the back door, and the attacker wins. The very first version of this um, attack I wrote was in an unreleased version of the OWASP dependency check project. It will never be released, <laughs> but any Spring Boot application that you analyzed with dependency check would have a reverse uh, would have that reverse shell dropped right into that application. This type of attack is not limited to Java. This is an insider threat problem for your open source community. <laughs> a threat actor with enough influence, be it geopolitical, monetary, ideological, has the ability to become an insider threat in your software supply chain may take nation state level sponsorship, but it is possible. This could be through you know, open source build plugins you use, um, Maven, Gradle, Poetry. It's, you know, it's not limited to Java, like I said. Uh, your testing frameworks, your mocking frameworks, anything running during the build has the opportunity to affect the build output. Uh, it gets it gets really interesting in some of the build systems, but it is possible to do. It could even be your Gradle or Maven wrapper in that repo you just cloned. Could be malicious. So, what can we do to try and raise the assurance level for our builds? Well, one of the mitigations was actually described in Salsa version 1.0 in the uh, use a compromised runtime dependency. The mitigation described actually, I think, applies somewhat to the build time dependencies as well. And this all comes down to the fact that Salsa is not transitive. You could have a Salsa level 3 build, but that does not mean that the dependencies you used have even a Salsa level 1. That they could have done nothing, and you still are Salsa level 3 because it is not transitive. <laughs> but the mitigation is to apply Salsa recursively. Honestly, we're just at the beginning of people even being able to apply Salsa to their own builds. Yes, there are some shining stars out there. There are people who are doing this um, even recursively. I found a couple of people who have done that, but honestly, <laughs> just consider the level of effort <laughs> of applying Salsa recursively to everything for your entire build. Is it feasible today? I mean, this is just the Maven build. What about Maven itself? Uh, the JDK, the operating system. In many cases, these dependencies are maintained by open source developers in their free time. And now we're not only saying, hey, please write secure code, but also, could you make sure that your build is secure and that you're publishing provenance information and all of this, if, if we want to see this done, the only way that we can, that I can see that making this happen is to improve the tools. And Microsoft has done a great job working with uh, NPM. Um, they've released some new features uh, during Black Hat uh, earlier this year. Fantastic work. Um, it's making it easier in the NPM space. But we have to improve the tooling everywhere. And we have to get people to do this. So the only way I see this happening is for us as organizations using open source software is to contribute back to the developers building your open source code or building the open source that you use be it through sponsoring those developers or even having your developers contribute back to those projects to help secure the builds
And you have to consider not just the projects you're using directly, but also the transitive dependencies of the projects they are using, because that is all part of your supply chain. But it all comes down to what level of assurance do you really need? How far down this rabbit hole do you have to go? Is there anything else that can save us? Well, a lot of people talk about the idea of reproducible builds. This is the idea that if I take the source code and I build it on system A, and then I take the source code and I build it on system B, I will get the exact same bit for bit output and I can compare the hashes and I can be assured that no malware was on system A um, that compromised the build. Anybody in the community can build the software and get the exact same bit for bit output, calculate the hash and it's gonna be identical. This hash is gonna save us. But what if the build plugin was compromised? gets brought into build, in, into build system A, compromises the output, gets brought into build system B, and now you have a reproducibly compromised build. Yeah, uh, that demo earlier did use reproducible builds. Every time you build that demo application, it will have the exact same hash anywhere you build it because it pulls in that malicious build plugin into the build and compromises the build output. It's really important to understand the difference between vulnerable and malicious dependencies. To me, this is really the difference between traditional supply chain attacks and modern supply chain attacks. Traditional supply chain attacks, we'd see people exploiting vulnerable dependencies. Um, I mean, like this poor guy was just trying to write some PHP code and help the world out. <laughs> but the modern attacks, they're, they're actually, you know, intentionally subverting the supply chain. In a lot of cases, we've seen people attacking the developer tool chain like I've been talking about. So how do we go about actually detecting malicious builds? Well, after reading about the SolarWinds breach, uh, I was challenged to come up with a technique to identify if a build had been tampered with during the build process. And what I came up with is a way to verify that the build artifact could have been produced from the given source code. This is one of the reasons why I think the provenance information is needed because you actually have to be able to trace back to this is the exact version of the source code that built this version of the dependency. But how do you do that without recompiling it? In which case you might be affected by that build plugin again. So how do you do this validation? It sounds really hard, right? Well, turns out it only becomes in, in my testing and, and development of kind of some of the POCs, it only gets really hard if you start looking at native executables. And even then, I think there's some things that we can do. And remember, SolarWinds was .NET. That wasn't even a native executable. So the idea is to simply build a model from the source code and build a model from the build artifact and compare the two models. It's really easy to build this model from source code. I mean, that's what, you know, y you can use the same type of lectures and parsers that are used in the compilers today um, to generate this model. Uh, in my testing, um, it, it's gonna vary on how deep into these, um, in, into how much assurance you actually need. In my case, when I was doing these POCs, I wasn't looking for the very subtle backdoors. I was looking for the blatant, we dropped a solar wind style, you know, 4,000 lines of code was dropped into my application kind of thing. And what I found is that if you just extracted, you know, this is Java, so we extracted the classes, the methods defined, their arguments, the constants used, and the methods that they called. I didn't even get down into any of the conditional or the branching, just a high level sketch of that application. That worked pretty well. And if you've never seen like a Java class file or a .NET class file in a hex editor, this is what it looks like. It's actually a very well-known format and it contains a lot, you can just see over here, a lot of textual information is in this binary or the build artifact. And as no surprise, you can use tools to parse this information out and generate the exact same model from the build artifact. Uh, you can do this in other technologies. If you're doing it in interpreted languages, 
quite possibly the same model generation tool is used for the source code and the build artifact or the distribution artifact. And once you have both models generated, you can simply compare them. If they're the same, nothing malicious happened during the build. However, the models are different. If something truly malicious is injected into your build, it really stands out. So what were some of the challenges with building this in my uh, POC that I did? Um, well, of course, there's compiler changes and optimizations. Like in Java, if you do string concatenation, string plus string, in the class file, that actually becomes string builder dot append dot append. Um, there's a few other uh, things that happen in compilation, but they're consistent. And so in your comparison algorithms, you can code around these, in, these differences between what might be in the um, class file versus what's in the source code. Another thing are code generators. I'm not talking about Gen AI. I'm talking about the type of code generators that you would include in your build. In a lot of cases, these are things like um, look at a schema and generate a plain old object that's just getters, setters, and fields. Um, and again, these are things that you can code around um, when you're building the comparison algorithm. Or, you know, I coded around them when I built my comparison algorithm. The last real challenge that I came up with was the amount of information that you can ex easily extract um, from a build artifact does vary by the technology stack. And when you get down into native executables, it does become a little bit more difficult um, to extract detailed information easily. It's possible, it's just harder. <laughs> um, but at a bare minimum, you can easily extract the system calls and constants used within that PE executable or the native executable. And if you can't trace those back to what's in the source code, you might have to consider what are those system calls and could they have be malicious? So even then, I think there's some things that we can do, even at the native executable level. So what are some of the other solutions that are available today? Well, there are several vendors, some of which are out in the, bus uh, you know, in the business hall area here today. Um, I even found one vendor um, at when I gave this talk, a version of this talk at Black Hat, where they were actually doing what I just described, <laughs> um, where they're actually comparing what's in the source code repo to what the binary or the the source code to what is in the binary or the distributed artifact. They're they're doing that comparison. I thought it was really, really fascinating that more than one person came up with this idea. Um, other vendors are actually looking at the build artifacts um, using machine learning and other techniques to extract behaviors and identify if something is you know malicious or you know they're extracting behaviors and telling you if there's doing if there's something that looks a little fishy in there in some cases they're actually doing takedown requ requests out on npm pypy Ruby gems, if they find something that is truly malicious. But in a lot of cases, they, they may not be able to get a takedown request fulfilled because it's quasi malicious, you know, information leakage kind of things. Um, and so my concern with these techniques is that if we start looking at build plugins, a lot of those behavior that we would flag as malicious or we would want to flag as malicious looks identical to the behavior of what the build plugin itself would do. Write stuff to the target classes directory, compile code. These are the things we expect build plugins to do. And so if you're just looking for behaviors, you could have some false negatives, which are always scary. And that's why I think combining these two techniques uh, would be a very viable solution. But unfortunately, that doesn't exist today. What can we do today? Well, one of the number one things you can do today is reduce the number of dependencies that you use. Follow the Deming principle. Use fewer, higher quality vendors for your third party dependencies. Do not use code generators during the build process. Use them absolutely use them. They are valuable. 
Use them during the development process. This is also going to reduce your dependencies in your, in your build system. But that generated code, check it into your source code repo. Treat it just like you do any other source code. Scan it with your static analyzers. Um, do peer reviews of it. In a lot of cases, that generated code is going to be super easy to review because it's just setters and getters. And skim it, you're good. Lastly, talk to your vendors in both the static analysis and supply chain space about these ideas of build, uh, of build verification. Because another thing that I, that I kind of forgot to mention there is a lot of these vendors who are doing this analysis of look, doing the comparison of what's in the source code and what's in the binary, looking at the build artifacts, they're only doing that on the things that you're using. Nobody, nobody really is doing it on the things that you are building. So you should use that technology on the stuff that you build, not just the stuff that you use. In summary, I th hope that I've shown everybody here that the trusting trust problem is very real. Anything running during the build can affect the build output reproducibly. Lastly, support your open source developers. They're the ones that are gonna secure the builds of the open source dependencies that you use. Thank you very much. Um, we still have like three minutes. If anybody does have a question, I can take it um, and, and attempt to answer. <laughs> The, the, the which? The hardware. Oh, ha okay. So what is the difference between like the hardware uh, bill of materials and the manufacturing bill of materials? Um, I'm not as familiar with what they're talking about with the hardware, but I'm assuming that is getting down into um, talking about what are your servers, what are the motherboards, the processors, the things there that are running, whereas the manufacturing bill of materials um, I, originally, that issue that um, Steve pointed me at, it was called the formulation bill of materials, and I really wish it would have stayed formulation bill of materials because a really great opportunity was missed there. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, I think Kevin's still back here. He's got a talk tomorrow, um, I think, called S-bomb to F-bomb. <laughs> But uh, that's really the the, the uh, manufacturing bill of materials is is really about what went into the software that's being built. What are the dependencies um, used during the construction of your software? Okay, like you know, what went into like a cost? Uh, no, like uh, what version of Maven did you use? What were the Maven build plugins that you used? Okay. Uh, what were the uh, test scope dependencies? You know, how did we test it? How did, you know, all of that stuff. Um, do we have time for one more? Okay, one, yeah, uh, the, on the, yeah, you uh, with, with the mask, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, there, it, there are so many things that we could focus on with supply chain security and how we are doing things. Um, it, it, it still is, even though we've been doing supply chain security for a, a little while, it is still a very nascent space. Uh, it's expanding. We're getting better at it. Um, hopefully someday it's, a, it's more of a solved problem, but I think it's going to be a little while. Thank you. <laughs>